the handout that I prepared for you to look at while we discuss the history. I'm an old teacher and I always have to have a visual. Uh, so let's look at the handout as we go through. The first photo on the handout is of Charlie and Nancy Russell. Cowboy artist Charlie Russell is credited with making cowboy artwork popular in the early years of settlement on the American frontier. He was one of the only artists who lived in the West and he painted what he saw during that time. He actually lived what he drew. Joe Jay lived what he drew. Grimm has lived what he drew. And that is what a cowboy artist is all about, what I think. I have included my favorite of Russell's work entitled A Brought to Breakfast. And that's on the handout. This, this print was on my grandparents' wall, on her, their kitchen wall, all the years that I was growing up. And I often looked at that picture, and I thought, my God, you know, I wonder what really happened that day. <laughs> Luckily, today, we have the internet. So I looked up what really happened. This event happened in Montana, Judith Basin, in 1887. Now, you know, usually cowboys that are particip participating in a cattle drive, they don't just take one horse on that cattle drive. They take eight to 10 horses on that cattle drive because they're having to ride them every day. So of course, some of these horses on occasion might become a bronc when they started to get on them. And this is what happened. This bronc was totally out of control from the moment that cowboy got on him. And if you look at this picture on the three, you didn't get one. If you look at this picture, uh, you can see on the side here, there's two people that are sitting on the other side of the campfire. Mm -hmm. One of those was probably Charlie Russell because he said that's where he was sitting. And I had to write this down because I thought it was so cool. The Bronx, he knocked the top off the Dutch oven, he spilled five gallons of hot water into the fire and the big coffee pot and kicked the frying pan into the air as a final gesture. Now, as we all know, cooks are temperamental. Cooks are all kind of temperamental. Even down here at the restaurant, they're like that, but especially these cowboy cooks were temperamental. That cook was so mad, he jumped up and he grabbed the biggest butcher knife he could find and he went after that horse. But luckily, the bronc and the horse went in a different direction. <laughs> so I thought that, that was a pretty cool story. Charlie Russell, if you look at the picture, that is him and his wife. And he was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1864. At the end, at the end of the Civil War. And you know, he was actually a member of a really prosperous family and they were secure in the manufacturing business. But by the time he was 13, you know what he wanted to be? Cowboy. A cowboy, right? <laughs> he had made up his mind. And you know, that wasn't such a far-fetched far -fetched profession, if you think about it. During those days, a lot of cowboys, a lot of boys ran away from home to become cowboys. So Charlie, up to the age of 13, periodically he would go down to the Mississippi River and run away and try to get them to take him west. Nobody would. So he would go back home and he would say, please, I want to go west. Let me go west. Let me go be a cowboy. Um, they tried everything with him. They even sent him to a military school in New Jersey, and it did not work, OK? So well, let's think about this for a minute. Today, if your 13-year-old grandson or your 13-year-old son came up to you and said, hey, you know, I'm going to hitchhike up to Wyoming, and I'm going to be a cowboy. What would you say to him? <laughs> You're not going to go up there and do that. But back in the day, they did. Did you know that most of the cowboys were orphans that went on these trains? A lot of them were. Have any of you ever read The Orphan Trains, the book about orphans? It's a horrible, heart-rending book. I mean, these kids in New York were orphans. I mean, people died early. People died by the time they were 40. And there were lots of them, so they sent them out west, these orphans. The Mount West, and it did not work out that well. Sometimes they were kind of made slaves, but it was better than starving on the streets of New York. All right, um, ranchers publicizing cow drives during this time, they actually have, and I couldn't find my poster, I actually have one of it. On the very bottom, it says, orphans preferred. Oh, and they believe wow. that. All right, and actually, I think this is where the term cowboy came from. You think I'm right on that, or is there another interpretation? Because oh, there were so many cowboys, so many young guys that went west. Okay, and like Joe Jay and Grim Lee, Charlie Russell's work always told a story. 
and was based on personal experiences and friendships he made. There's Walter Gay, finally. I'm <laughs> teasing Walter Gay. He painted what he saw of the vanishing West. Now, during Charlie Russell's time, 1880s, was the West, was the West vanishing? Did we still have a lot of wide open spaces in the West? Not really. I mean, people were, you know, that, that era was starting to vanish. And because of Charlie Russell, we know about the cattle drives. Okay, right now, I want you to raise your hand. How many people have a camera on them? Everybody, don't you? Because we have a camera. Back then, not everybody had a camera. You know, the newspaper men, a few people had them. So these cowboy artists, they were the ones who documented the West. They were the ones who showed us about that. And you know, even, even historians, you know, and archaeologists have looked at his paintings. And the good thing about Charlie Russell is he loved the Plains tribes. He had a real affinity with them. So he would paint them when they were going into battle, when they were going out hunting, when they were just hanging out in, in you know, their village. And, and the, the clothes that they had on and stuff like that, he was really good at that. Now as soon as Charlie Russell, he got to, to Montana, he changed his name to Kid Russell. Okay? And he was very proud of that. Now I don't know how many works Joe Jay had all together. Thousands? I don't know. Charlie Russell completed 4,000 pieces of artwork during his time. That's a lot. Now, but Charlie Russell, like many cowboys who came after him, was not into marketing his artwork. <laughs> he drew for pleasure, and he gave away most of his images. I don't think Joe Jay was into marketing his artwork either, and I don't know if Bill was either. All right? He would rather share a few drinks and socialize with friends and market his artwork. <laughs> the money yeah, really right. didn't matter to him. It really didn't. But the old saying goes, behind every successful man is a good woman. Well, that was certainly the case with Charlie Russell. You can look at her right there in the picture. If not for his wife, Nancy Cooper Russell, I don't think we would have ever known about Charlie Russell. She was his business manager and his public relations expert, and she was his greatest advocate. Nancy was born in Kentucky but moved with her family to Montana in 1890. But by the time she was 16, she was an orphan. Can you believe it? And so she got work with the house, as a housekeeper in Cascade, Montana, where she was later meet Charlie. He married in 1896 when Charlie was 32 and Nancy 18. Now that's another thing that's changed over the years, okay? Back during the Old West, you would have found a lot of women married to men 30, 40 years older than them. Any idea why? <laughs> All right, the West was a tough place on women. And a lot of these men were on their fourth marriage because their wives had died before this. So I just noticed they kept marrying them younger and younger. <laughs> All right. Um, but without Nancy's direction and business savvy, Charlie Russell would have continued his life as a cowboy, trading sketches for drinks rather than becoming one of the highest paid artists of his time. You know, his artwork can be found everywhere, and his name is well known even, even in other countries. How many of you had never heard of him? Oh, well, okay, well, I guess there's a few of you. <laughs> now, Russell's cowboy friends, they did not care for Nancy. They felt she ruled his life way too much. She did try to keep him away from his old cowboy friends and drinking buddies, but once or twice a month, she allowed him to meet his friends at the local bar. But he could only have two beers, and then he had to return home. Can you believe that? And my friend Linda helped him with this one, but Ian Tyson wrote a song about Charlie named the gift. Have you heard it? Yes. And I want to just read a couple stanzas. In old St. Louis, over in Missouri, the mighty Mississippi, well, it rolls and it flows. A son was born to Mary Russell, and it starts the legend every cowboy knows. Young Kid Russell was born to wonder, ever westward he was bound. Just a kid of 16 in 1880, up in old wild Montana, he made his home. When the Lord called Charlie to his home up yonder, he said, Kid Russell, I got a job for you. You're in charge of sunsets up in old Montana, because I can't quite paint them quite as good as you. And when we're done, we'll go out and we'll have a few. And Nancy Russell will make sure it's just two. <laughs> but she had to. 
I, I don't mean to say this, but if you've ever been with cowboys when they start drinking, you might as well just let them go. You know what I mean? So that's what she had to do. <laughs> In 1926, Russell's health began to fail, and he went to Rochester, Minnesota for a quarter operation. You all know how cowboys and men in general are. They avoid going to the doctor as long as they can. Nancy tried and tried to get him to go to the doctor, and when she finally convinced him, it was just too late. The quarter had become so large that he couldn't even hardly swallow. And so he went up and he had an operation in the spring of 1926 and he died in October of 1926. But you know, at least he passed away in his beloved Montana with his wife Nancy by his side. And maybe she gave him a couple beers at the end, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's look at our sheet once again. And I have my most favorite picture of Joe Jay here. I never knew that Susan took the picture. Uh, Dorothy Cole gave me these pictures years ago. And it looks like he's filing his nails. He's not, is he? Is he filing his nails with that fire? <laughs> All right, well, I guess he really is, you know? Uh, <clears throat> Joe Jay, he was so much like Charlie Russell. Don't you guys think in a lot of ways? It, he did not become as famous as Charlie Russell, but they have a lot of similar traits. He was a prolific artist of ranch life and a great historian and storyteller as well. Just like Charlie Russell, just like Grimm. I mean, they're great storytellers. His work captures snapshots in time of real life events and of well-known characters from the past. Every one of his stories is about somebody that somebody knew at one time, you know, or knew of. Uh, and who was the first artist of Mountaineer? Help me, come on. All right, it was not, it was Pop Schaefer. And if you have time, Anne and Donna have really worked on a nice little display in here about, about Pop Schaefer and has shown some of his artwork and stuff like that. And then Joe Jay. And you know, they were totally different, vastly different to artists, but they both added to the history. You know, Joe Jay, he doodled and you know, I could just tick myself. I remember him doodling on napkins or having lunch and just leaving them on the table. I never took them. I didn't think I could as a kid, and I wish I had them now. <laughs> he gave them away to those who wanted them. He painted murals on the walls of the homes he recreated. He created delightful images of Christmas cards each holiday season, and made his own postcards and short messages for special friends. And Wilda Gay is here, and she has brought some of that, and you can browse through it afterwards. She doesn't want to sell it, but you are welcome to look at it. You know what it seems like to me in my research? that one of the requirements of being a cowboy artist is to be a great storyteller as well. Um, and, and you know, you could tell a great story about these pictures, couldn't you? Mm -hmm. Joe Jay spent most of his life on his ranch near Shelby, where members of his family are still live today, and he is buried. Throughout his life, he became an accomplished and well-known artist of cowboy life, but mainly in just in this region, you know, just in New Mexico, maybe the surrounding states, not, not, not like Charlie Russell, because he didn't have a Nancy Cooper behind him. <laughs> now, I have included my two favorite drawings of Joe Jay's, and they're on the handout sheet. In fact, these two are hanging on my wall at home. And this is also... All right, the first drawing on the handout is entitled An Incident in Magdalena, which is my favorite one. Uh, Joe Jay's neighbor, Wade Steele, and I didn't even think about it until this morning when Cody, Cody uh, Matthews told me that that was his grandpa. I had forgotten about that, you know, and I just thought that was cool. He was the local brand inspector, and he traveled to Magdalena one afternoon to give a rancher from the fight ranch. And if you look really close on this picture, and Linda helped me with this one too, it has FIT on it. And the fight ranch was, I don't know, about a 10 section ranch. Was it that big? 10 to 20? I don't know, Linda. It was Wasn't that big? It was a lot bigger than that. It was really? down next to the stallion site. Yeah. So I have like 100 acres, I don't know. And anyway, it was a major ranch, and they had this cantankerous cow, you know. And so he had decided to sell that cow. And so Wade still had to go, and he had to give them a permit to sell the cow at an auction in Albuquerque. Well, they sealed the deal, and they decided to have a few beers afterwards. They decided to have a few more beers, and as you know, they did not make it. So they, they actually held that auction right in the bar that night. Can you believe it? Now, the first time that I ever saw this drawing was in the Golden Spur, Spur Saloon in Magdalena. 
the bartender told me the story I just told you, and I always thought this occurred in the Golden Spur. But Joe Day always leaves a little story at the bottom of his drawings, and he merely says a bar in Magdalena. And there were four bars in town at the time, so does anyone out there know which bar this occurred in? You know, kind of. All right, but you know, and you know, you may think this didn't happen, but I really think it did because I have been in the bars in Magdalena late at night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the second drawing is titled Plum Out of Their Country, and this one we do have, have up behind me, and it is for sale if anyone's interested in it uh, in the frame. Uh, it seems like, and, I, and I've talked to Linda about this a lot too, in the last few decades, more and more elk have moved into this country. You know, when I was a kid, I don't ever remember seeing an elk around here. I remember seeing them in the Guyanas on occasion, you know, but never here. But elk are becoming more and more. So I guess at this time, when he, when he did this picture, you know, there weren't many around, it doesn't sound like. You know, the story is told of how Joe Jay served in the Army Air Corps in the South Pacific during World War II. And he made enough money drawing portraits of his companions and painting images on B-24 bomber planes to start his first cattle herd when he returned home to Shelley after the war. And uh, I asked Susan if she could find some, and Grim was interested in those two, but she doesn't have them anymore, unfortunately. Um, I really would like to see some of those, wouldn't you? You know, Joe Jay, he passed away at the age of 82 in 2006. And hundreds, and well, maybe thousands of his images live on in museums, courthouses, grocery stores, government offices. And a few months ago, when Auntie and I were down at the Hub Furniture Store in Berlin, they had one of his prints hanging on the wall. They're everywhere. I even saw the one of his prints that's my favorite, which I haven't been able to find, is of all the horses that are together licking the salt. I saw that print at a little cafe up on the, on the Montana border. I think it was Claremont, Wyoming, in this little cafe. And so I asked the guy, I said, well, do you know who that is? He says, I had no idea who he is. It was there when, I, when we bought this. They didn't know who he was. Well, they know who he is now. They're a little bit back there telling them about him because I made sure. And, um, but you know, his artwork is really cherished by those who knew him. And they're often passed on to family members and friends. I mean, I'm sure all of you here cherish his artwork, as I do. I mean, how many of us really get to know a truly famous artist in our lifetime? And I've gotten to know two now. <laughs> this past year. I never heard of him before. I'm sorry, Graham, but I had not heard of him either. And uh, I, I moved when he moved here, so but I knew all his friends, and I knew everybody he knew, but I didn't know him. And uh, so this Rancher's Day poster that's right beside Graham on this side over here, I discovered, I got one of these in 19, I have two of them, so I'm giving Graham this one. Uh, and I saw his name on there, and I thought, well, who is this cowboy? And um, my friend, Julie Carter, are you here, Judy? Julie? She was going to come. My friend Julie Carter described Grimm in this way. Girl, you're in for a ride with this one. <laughs> Grimm is one of the toughest survivors with a pen and pencil, and a wonderful journey in art that he's not lit up on yet. He's the people storyteller <coughs> in pencil, and he's local. Well, as local as the outback of Chupadera can be. I like that. <laughs> now, Grim Lee's full name is Oliver Lee IV. 
Does this ring a bell with anyone out there? Yeah. Yeah. Ten times they tell me. Okay. Yes, Grimm is the great grandson of the infamous Oliver Lee. <laughs> Oliver Lee was a New Mexico rancher. He was a law officer. He was a state legislator, a businessman, and a probable outlaw, accused of the mysterious murders of A.J. Fountain and his eight-year-old son in the 1890s. The murder has never been solved, and people are still taking sides, but sorry, this story is for another lecture. <laughs> Grimm, he graduated from Reserve High School and lived near Horse Springs. Did anybody know where Horse Springs is? I know where that is, but it's not much of anything now, but it's, it's still a cool place. It's between Dallin and Reserve, and he, uh, while growing up, he moved to the area here around Mount Nair when he bought the old Conant Ranch, which Cookie's family's old ranch, and began concentrating on his artwork. Grimm, he knew Joe Jay personally, and they were good friends. And you know, Susan told me that the last year or so of, of Joe Jay's life, that Grimm would call him every afternoon and talk to him, and it was just the bright spot in his day. Um, he will now relate, now Grimm, I'm gonna turn this over to Grimm now, and he will now relate a few stories about Joe Jay and what it's like to be an artist in the 21st century. And then there's gonna be a little, dis little discussion on memories you all have of Joe Jay and his legacy. And I'm sure many of you have great stories. So I'm going to turn this over to my friend. Here, name of Delbert Autry, and he said he was down there when he was about 14 years old. And they'd been doing something, and uh, he, he he had to run to the bathroom real quick. But he ran in the house and blasted through the bathroom door, and there was this young 16-year-old <laughs> girl in there, kind of undressed, and. and, and and he said it changed his life. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Cookie. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I don't know where to start on this, but maybe I'll start a little bit about when I started drawing. I've been drawing. My mom found some drawings when I was three years old. Old, I was already starting to draw little caterpillar dozers and things like that, horses and stuff. And when I was in the fourth grade, I had appendicitis, really bad, and I was in the hospital for a long time. Anyways, while I was in there, my mom bought me two books. Trails Plowed Under, and uh, Good Medicine, both Charlie Russell books. And it just, I, I don't know, I, I read those every day, and one is of Charlie Russell's illustrated letters he wrote to people all the time. And, and the other is uh, stories, the Trails Plowed Under, stories that he collected in Montana. Fabulous stories, and then he illustrated each of them. And uh, ah, after that, I said, this is what I'm going to do. And I love, I've collected, I have a whole huge box full of tapes down in the reserve area down there. Lots of old timers down there. When I was a kid, and about that same time, 
there were these two ladies that lived off the hill from the grade school, Lila and Beulah Bench, and uh, they were raised on Beaver Creek down in the wilderness, and uh, in the middle of nowhere. And this was in the, in the late 1800s, is when they were young. And they, used, I'd go down there and they'd tell me stories about the native Indians coming in to get water and then seeing them, and they just were, it wasn't a big deal, it was just what was happening back then. And after, I just started collecting story after story, tape recording, old timers. So I have this raft of uh, stories that I've been trying to illustrate, retell like they were told to me, just like the old timers that told me the stories. Uh, and retell them and then do several. Illustrating is kind of a funny thing. Uh, <coughs> You have these wonderful stories, and you and you have to be careful where you put the illustration as to not give away the the, the funny part at the very end because that's the that's the juice of the whole story. But uh, I I love doing it. It's just a pleasure to do, and I I'm still collecting stories. And Dixie was talking about me. Uh, this paper plate thing is just gone nuts. <laughs> Who'd ever thought? And, and my dad and my teachers were all tell, always telling me I was always in trouble at school. If you don't straighten up, you're never going to mount the hill of beans. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and I, I flash these paper plates in front of them. I tell them. I've sold three of these paper plates for a thousand dollars a piece. <laughs> 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 so anybody that sold the paper plates for a thousand dollars. Anyway, uh, where to go from here? I need to get my mouth to get dry. Uh, yeah, Jude, I Joe Jay, going back to Joe Jay. Oh, I can't tell you. And I didn't know much about Joe Jay until we we bought the Conan place down there. And he, I saw, we had a, my mom and dad, they had a barn warming deal when they built a barn down there. And uh, Joe Jay came to that party and I, I got to know him then and I thought, man, this guy and I are gonna have fun together. <laughs> and he used to be, not, not when we first went there, but, but at the art shows here in Mountain Air that they used to have, uh, he and I just sit there and talk and talk and talk. And <laughs> I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> I wish you could see how I sharpen my pencils. <laughs> I take the lead off and about that much of the lead is showing and then I grind it until it's like a needle point and I'm just right there. And certain types of paper and this and that. And, and Joe Jay and I were talking one, one day and he asked me, what kind of pencils do you use? And I said, whoa, man. I use Burrell turquoise pencils and I use uh, a, B, a 6B, a 3B, and a B, HB, and a, and a H, and I just went on. And, and then I do this and I do that. And I said, uh, what kind of pencils do you use, Joe Jay? He goes, oh, I, I go down there to blend to uh, Ranchero and uh, Oh, Watson, he give me a whole handful of those carpenter pencils. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way he was. <laughs> and I don't think Joe Jay, did Joe Jay ever take any art lessons? Did he? No, and I think about that. You, you weren't going to tell him what to do. It, it just the way he was. And, and, and this picture here, he came by, he, he didn't have any, of course, what 
Dixon was saying is right. Uh, these elk have been migrating and moving in areas of areas in New Mexico where there's never been an elk or opportunity to snake jump fence and they can go wherever they want to. And he, but he didn't have any pictures of elk. And he called me one day and he said, can I come back? Do you have any pictures of elk? I said, yeah, I got a whole envelope full of them, about 100 pictures. And so he came down there and we, I gave him the envelope. We talked and talked and talked. And, but he, and I'm so mad to this day, there, he and, he and I kind of believe that I'm going to stir the pot here with some people, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not a real big believer in well witching and that kind of thing. And Joe Jay wouldn't either. And, and he, he told me a story, and I just, dang it, it just killed me that I can't remember, but off towards uh, Clint Donaldson's ranch down there. He, and he told me the story about, I can't remember who wished the well and they drilled. And he, he was such a good storyteller. It just went on and on and on and on, getting ready that they found, you know, a gush of water down there, artesian well or something. He let the air out of me so bad. And I should have known <laughs> with him that it was going to be a funny story. Uh, we, he did a painting, and I don't know if, if, if anybody from the family remembers any of it, but he did a, a really different drawing of a buffalo skull, a buffalo head that he, he brought in. And he went a little, it, it was just a really neat, different graphic type drawing, and I never saw anything that he'd ever done like that. But it didn't matter what he, I think whatever Joe Jay, Jay did, he and I'm like the same way. We're perfectionists and just always want to do that kind of artwork. And anyway, I'm going to throw it back. Do you all have any questions or anything? Uh, um, I uh, and I'm terrible. I got in trouble. I, I, I've always wondered if Joe Jay got in trouble. In the School uh, drawing. <laughs> yeah. Pictures. Uh, just told me. Uh, yeah. And I get in trouble all the time. And I remember once I was going to tell you a story. I'm, I'm real crazy about hunting arrowheads. Just arrow. If I hunt arrowheads in Walmart. Chance somebody might <laughs> drop them <in> there. <laughs> but used to have archaeologists come to the ranch of Four Springs because the San Augustine Plains, there it was a huge lake bed, and all around the shorelines of that, there were old, old Indians, long, long, you know, 10, 12,000 year old Indians. And uh, they came out, the archaeologists held a field school one time. and and the, the guy that was in charge of the field school was named Chip Wells. He asked me if I knew anywhere where they could just go prowl around and he could teach the kids how to look for things uh, as far as archaeology goes. And I said, yeah, there's a, at Four Springs, right, when you go past West Four Springs, there's a big mountain there and there's a really rocky mountain. There's this deep canyon there that drains off to the Augustine Plains. And, and he said, well, yeah, we'll go up there and I'll teach these kids. So you can be the leader. And so we all met there. There was about 25 or 30 uh, college students, summer college students there. And so we get together and we start wandering up this canyon. It kind of snakes around and snakes around. We come around this one big curve and there's this aspen tree there that grows up. And there's this image of a naked girl carved on this. <laughs> and right there, Brim Lee. That's <laughs> 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 not <laughs> It was terrible. <laughs> Thank you.
Midland, Texas. What a master. He, he was one of the CA artists. And uh, just, oh, golly. And, and he, uh, Tom Bride, yeah, I just forgot his name, last name. But he gave me, right, he was a World War II veteran. And right before he passed away, he gave me all of this boxes of his stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, he taught me how to do pastel paintings. Uh, and I love pastel. It, 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 it's a real grainy, textured, you, you know, weathered feeling. And I did that bull skull. And then I've got, I've got a bunch more that I want to do. I'm in the process of, uh, I want to do, uh, a really big, that one was pretty good size, but I want to do one that's four by eight feet. Mm -hmm. And I want to do, and it's typical of that Red Rock country down southwest of here, I want to do uh, a raven in the top of a, a dead choya and the limbs coming up to the top. And and it it's set in these red rocks and I'll, I'm going to do a couple of Indian paintbrush because I, I need the red color and the green color. And then it's going to be in a rock about that big. And then I'm going to do about a five foot diamond back crawling up, crawling up through the, it'll be green. And, and the raven is raisin, is raisin cane. It'll take me quite a while. I'll have to get a lift so I can do the upper part of it and work it down, but I'm just, I can't wait to get that one started. We always, we are as well. And we always have four or five other ideas we got to one at the same time. But, and I, I love you, Jake, so we were talking about all those raunchy, and he wasn't afraid. And, <laughs> and, 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 they should go with him. Oh, well, and I should be. You just can't be doing this. He can't. Ah, oh, he, he, he didn't. He, I wouldn't, I'm just sorry. He didn't care for Bill Clinton really bad. And he, and he really didn't like Hillary. And he, <laughs> and, and I have, I have about 10 of those that I couldn't bring. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he was so good at drawing Bill and Hillary. <laughs> and, well, I don't want to bother you all anymore. Wonderful personality. 
Yeah, I, I hope I can tell this without crying, but I do have one story I'd like to tell about him. My dad passed away in like 1968, uh, two weeks before the county fair. And I had a, a camp I had raised, and uh, I just didn't even want to take it to the fair. I was so upset, you know, he had just passed away. And I guess JJ was watching me that day because I was taking my cap into the ring and I was, oh, I was down, I was down. And he comes up by me and he puts his arm around me and he says, honey, your dad, be proud of you. You get in there and you do it, girl. And I never forgot that about him. I mean, he, he saw me standing there and he could tell I was having a hell of a time. And I don't think I would have gone in that ring without him saying that that day. And that's a good, that's a good memory of my memory of him. I didn't cry. <laughs> Um, Joe Jay was our neighbor. Our family had a ranch down at Shumley. And uh, like Dixie, I wish I had kept some. He would just, he fiddled all the time, just as a, not fiddled, fiddled like that. And grew, grew stuff. Grew. And his house burned down. I think I was living in Tier to see, and his house burned down. And so I got a box of junk. And I mailed it to him. And he called me and he said, well, okay, well, you know, you know who's this. And I said, you don't have any junk, right? So I sent you some junk. And he said, wow, I thought you didn't think that was funny. But he, and the next time he saw my dad, he said, I'm a little bit worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so which story? And and you know he did rock work. He did um, fireplaces. fireplaces. And he not only did fireplaces. I think he moved in with you two or three years while he did the fireplaces. <laughs> <laughs> family. And he'd always kind of grin. You know that was the thing about Joe Jay that I remember from being a little kid was he always had kind of a little. Sideways grand, like he knew something that you should know, but that you didn't. And he probably, and he probably did. And he liked to dance, and he liked music, and he liked stories. And um, he was just a fun, a fun guy. And he was able to collect. Oh gosh, he had lots of stories and grins, right? I can't think of any of them right at the moment. But I've got some pictures back there that are. A little bit risque of um, Bill Clinton. Um, incidentally, they all have Bill Clinton's drawers off, and um, he seemed to think that Bill Clinton had trouble keeping his pants off. Uh, and, and, and coincidentally, some of them have Bill Clinton in a dress, and now it's really kind of 
the puddle because we have that picture at Epstein's of Bill Clinton. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, anyway, maybe Joe J. did know something. <laughs> Thank you. shoulder and saw that picture I was drawing and she says dad is that well that you can't I said yeah she said you're gonna have to do a little erasing and add more gut more gut less but <laughs> and the story was about he drove up out across the river over here over at the loveless way over there, and he drove up to this dirt tank, and uh, it was one of his son's longhorn cows, one of the original ones, I, that's just what he told me, was, it was drying up, and she was stuck in the middle of it out there, oh, no. and and he didn't know what he was going to do, and he couldn't, he couldn't rope her, she was far enough out, he, he could rope that far out there to rope around the horn to pull her out. So he he ridded himself with his breeches and his shirt and had his cowboy hat and he put his boots back on. <laughs> and he got a rope and anyways he waited out there and he got stuck in the mud with the cow out there and just almost didn't make it out. <laughs> And Lee told me the story, and I could just picture it. In. And he finally got out and finally pulled the cow out. Lost one of his boots and I don't know what all. But I I retold the story from the cow's point of view. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like if it had been Sam Elliott or George Strait or somebody like that. No, Gunwell McKinley. <laughs> Saving me, and I, I drew that picture that Joey and I mean, uh, well, and standing on the edge of that tank down with the cow looking at him. And, <laughs> oh, he, he gave me crap all. But he always showed up at our art shows, my my book signings, and that kind of thing. It was always fun. It was a blast. Anyways. Anyone else have anything they'd like to say about this? Okay, so I want you to take some time. I know we're kind of jammed in here, but if any of you are interested in these uh, uh, portraits that are up here, they're for sale. Some of them have prices, some of them don't. Uh, and, they, and they are negotiable. And this one is Mod Meta. She only has like four, four of those left. And those are really collectible, so I, th I bought one. But anyway, uh, go around and look at these and talk to the people, look at Will Gaze, and, and just visit about Joe Jay. Thank you so much for coming. And, and there's lots of refreshments over here and a little bit of coffee, so please help yourself.